Okay. Uh, thank you for sticking around, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. It's only the second time in my life that I'm here in Montevideo. I should come more often. I hope to come more often. If I'm still invited after this talk, we'll see. Um, okay, so uh, I'm, I feel a bit of an imposter here. I'm not really a dynamicist. Uh, uh, what I really do is uh, geometric measure theory, fractal geometry, and from there I move to many different areas, including ergodic theory. So I'm going to talk about a uh, work which is a couple of years old, but I think is the closest to the theme of this conference because, uh, well, there is geometry, it's fractal geometry, so, but still geometry. Uh, there is dynamics, which is the Dublin map, and there is a semi-group of the natural numbers. So I guess it can fit into the... <laughs> you didn't specify what kind of geometry, what kind of dynamics, what kind of group, sorry. Okay, so... So I'm going to talk about uh, some problems that were posed by uh, Hiller Furstenberg in the, in the 60s. Furstenberg. He promoted the following principle, although he never stated the principle in this way. So this is my reinterpretation of his principle. Um, he suggested that expansions in basis two and three Principle. This is a principle. It's very, very vague, as a principle should be. Expansions in bases two and three have no common structure. And I'm going to use two and three uh, for the rest of the talk, but you can replace, in everything I will say, you can replace two and three by P and Q, which are not powers of the same integer. So two can be any P and three can be any Q, and what should happen is that uh, log P over log Q should be irrational. But I'm going to use two and three. Okay, so uh, as I say, this is very vague. So what, what could this possibly mean? So let me give an example of a more concrete, still a bit vague, but more concrete um, implementation of this principle. If you look at the uh, power of two, just the natural power of two, two to the n, for some large n, then the ternary expansion of this number should be pretty random. Because this number has a very, very special expansion in base two, one and all zeros. And there should be no common structure with expansions in base three. So it would be very surprising if the ternary expansion of this number um, is also special. This shouldn't happen. So I'm going to write it this way. So this means ternary expansion of a number uh, should look random to some degree. OK, nothing is known about this. For example, it's not even known if for or sufficiently large n, the th ternary expansion of two to the n has the digit one, for example, even once. So this is not known. And that's much, so what I just said, just two to the n having the digit one in the ternary expansion is much weaker than say that it behaves randomly. And that's completely open. Okay, so there is no dynamics here, so I'm going to move to uh, so sort of a bit more dynamical version of the principle, still very vague. Okay, suppose now we have uh, invariant sets or invariant measures under multiplication by two and three in the circle. So let A or maybe mu be uh, invariant under T2, T2 is just the Dublin map. And let B or nu, this means a sets or a measure, be invariant under multiplication by three on the circle. Then the principle says that A and B, and also the measures, mu and nu, should have no common structure. So being invariant under the Dublin map means that if you shift the binary expansion of a point in A, you're still in A. And being invariant under mu means that the statistics of the 
this true. So <laughs> if mu is times two invariant, it means that the statistics of the binary expansions of the points of points in the interval, the mu statistics are invariant if they shift the binary expansion. So this is related to this principle. This is a bit more dynamical and a little bit more concrete, but still very vague because what, so the question is, what does it mean for two sets or two measures to have no common structure? So, well, Lebesgue measure, the, the whole interval, the whole circle, is invariant under times two and times three, and Lebesgue measure is invariant under times two and times three. But everything has no structure, because it's everything. So the whole circle has no structure in the circle. And of course, there are also uh, finite sets of rational points, or measures supported on finite sets of rational points, which are also invariant under multiplication by two and by three. But these finite sets, you should think that these finite sets also have no structure. So other than these uh, trivial examples of jointly invariant sets or measures, this should happen. And well, before you can ask more delicate questions about what does it mean to have no common structure, the first thing you have to uh, believe is that a set and itself, or a measure and itself, have a lot of common structure, because it is the same set. So I hope everybody will agree that A and A have common structure. Well, maybe assuming that A is not trivial in the sense that it's neither the whole circle or a finite set, and the same for a measure and itself. OK, if you believe this principle, and you also believe that you and yourself have a lot of common structure, then you should believe that there should be no sets which are invariant under multiplication by two and by three. By the way, uh, the sets are always closed. Otherwise, they are trivial counterexamples to everything I'm going to say. Measures, Borel probability measures. OK, so if you believe this principle and you also believe this, then you should believe that there are no sets which are jointly invariant under multiplication by two and by three, and likewise for measures. And as I guess most of you know, this leads us to a very famous theorem and a very famous conjecture in ergodic theory. So for sets, uh, this is a pioneering result of Furstenberg, I think in uh, 1967. Uh, there is, okay, let's write it this way. If A is compact and times two and times three invariant, then A is finite or everything. So the only jointly invariant sets under times two and times three are the trivial ones. So this was historically the first result, and I would say this was the paper that started. I mean, this paper started many branches of modern ergodic theory, and one of the branches that started is the uh, study of dynamical rigidity. So this is a rigidity result. There are extremely many sets which are invariant under times two, and extremely many, like an unbelievably large zoo of sets which are invariant under times two or times three, but the only sets which are invariant under both are the trivial ones. So quite amazing. So this is a quite non-trivial result. Um, but it is, it is quite easy if the house of dimension of A is zero. In fact, so the proof goes by considering two cases. If A minus A, the arithmetic difference of A with itself. Um, what do I want to say? Is everything, what do I want to say? Well, anyway, uh, this is the, what do I want to say? Well, I will just say this. If the other dimension of A is zero, then A minus A also has dimension zero, and the result in that case, um, yeah, it's easy to see, sorry. Let, let, let's go again. So if A is not finite, and it's invariant times two and times three, then it's easy to see that A minus A is everything. But if A has dimension zero, then you can see that A minus A also has dimension zero, so it cannot be everything. So in the dimension zero case, this theorem is not difficult. So I, I just gave you the proof, in fact. You have to fill in the gaps, but it's just exercises. Um, OK, and I, I point this because uh, of what happens for measures. So it's still an open problem. So the most famous times 2 times 3 conjecture is still open today is that the same holds for measures. 
Well, measures you have to be a little bit more careful because you can take uh, complex combinations of uh, Lebesgue measure and atomic measures, but these should be the only measures, let's say, yeah, they should be the only measures which are invariant under times two and times three. So let's write it this way. If mu is invariant under times two and times three and maybe times two ergodic, something like this, then mu is atomic or Lebesgue. Okay, so another famous theorem in ergodic theory is the Rudolf Johnson uh, theorem that says that the conjecture is true if mu has positive entropy. And positive entropy is the same as positive dimension, so I prefer to write it in of dimension to uh, emphasize the point that I just made. So the case which is really, well, the case which is open and basically nothing is known about for measures is somehow the case which is easy for sets. So I'm going to talk about other results, and let me say that in some sense, so what I'm saying is uh, heuristical, it's not a formal statement, but in some sense, uh, the results that I'm going to present now improve dramatically in the case of positive dimension. I would say positive dimension, because there are more about sets. So in some, sense, in some sense, in the positive entropy case, positive dimension, positive entropy case, we know everything that there is to be known. But in the zero dimension case, zero entropy case, we, we know nothing. Okay, so um, okay, so this uh, give uh, this gives the answers. Um, well, answer and we don't know um, about this principle. If you look at the most basic way of interpreting common structure, which is just being equal. So if we want to go move beyond equal, then we can use some sort of geometry. So these sets are counter sets. So the ones that are non-trivial, they are counter sets. They are uncountable sets. If they are not, not finite and not the whole circle, then they are uncountable, but they have zero Lebesgue measure. In fact, they have dimension less than one. They could have dimension zero, but they are uncountable and they have house of dimension less than one. So they are fractal sets. And being invariant under the Dublin map or the tripling map is some sort of self-similarity or sub-self-similarity. So they are counter sets. So for example, the middle first counter set, the first fractal, everyone encounters in their lives is invariant other times three. So they are these sort of sets. So they are fractals. They are fractal sets. So, uh, so in order to look at what common structure could possibly mean to come up with even more concrete versions of this principle, one can use geometry. So I guess a measure, full measure uh, subset of the audience is very familiar with house of dimension. But as you see, I mean, very interested in sets of zero measure as well. So just in case, let me say uh, quickly a few words about house of dimension. So house of dimension is a number which is assigned uh, to all subset of, let's say, Rd, and takes values between 0 and d. So measurable, non measurable, it doesn't matter. Every set has a house of dimension. And it has many good properties. For example, uh, it is countable stable. It is a, so the Hausdorff dimension of a countable union is the supremum of the Hausdorff dimensions. And it gives the right value to sets for which you already know the dimension. A manifold of dimension k, a Hausdorff dimension k. So if you've never seen Hausdorff dimension, this is maybe all you need to know. And just for completeness, maybe let me give the definition because I'm going to use it a little bit later. So Hausdorff dimension of a, let me give this definition. Uh, first, we try to cover, okay, so, so you can take a nap, so almost everyone can take a nap, and then I will see who doesn't know the definition of hazard dimension, but it's going to take just one minute. So hazard dimension is based on efficient coverings of the set. So I cover the set by both of radii are i, and I look at the infimum of these sums where there is an exponent s. And then I want to find the critical exponent s, and that is the Hausdorff dimension. And maybe 
I look now at the infimum of the S for which this infimum is zero. And that is the house of dimension. Did I do it right? I probably didn't do it right, but something like this. Okay. So now let me say that uh, two subsets of R, well, it, this could be in RD, but from now on, almost everything will be in R, so, or R2 sometimes. So let's say that two subsets of R are resonant. So this is the definition. If the dimension, house of dimension of the arithmetic sum, so this just means all of the sums A plus B, where A is in A and B is in B. Just the arithmetic sum is equal to the minimum between the dimension of A plus the dimension of B and 1. In this case, we say that A and B resonate. They are resonant. And otherwise, well, this number is always an upper bound. OK, so uh, there, I'm go there's going to be a white lie for most of the talk. So what I'm, what I'm saying right now is actually not true. But Let's imagine that it's true. So wh what I'm going to say now is not true, but let's imagine that it's true. This is always an upper bound for this. Actually, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to say in one minute is not true, but, but don't worry about this. Either you know why, why it's not true, in which case it doesn't matter that I'm lying to you, or you don't know, in which case, believe me, that it's better than, than, that I'm lying to you. OK, so this is always an upper bound for this. And, well, you expect to have an equality. There should be a big conspiracy for the equality to fail. And I have lied there, so it's not true that this is always, well, anyway. So, generically, there is an equality, and there are many ways to make this precise. One way is mass transposition theorem that tells you that if you scale one of the sets by a random real number, then you have equality, for example. Asterisk, because that's not true, but let's imagine that it's true. So if there is an inequality, something has to be provoking that inequality. Basically, A and B should look very, they should match up, the structure of A and B should match up at arbitrarily small scales, something like this, if there is, if there is no equality. So otherwise, otherwise means that there is a strict inequality, because the right-hand side is always an upper bound. So if the dimension of the arithmetic sum is strictly less than the maximum of the dimensions should be minimum, minimum of the dimensions and one. In this case, uh, we say that they dissonate. Or we say that A and B are dissonant. OK, and if this happens, so in this case, if they are dissonant, then this really means that A and B do have common structure at small scale. There really has to be a reason for this inequality to occur. In general, there is equality. Inequality is the exception, and there should be a reason provoking it. OK, so here is another conjecture of Furstenberg, which also originated from the 60s. So this one is not in print, but, uh, well, Yuval Perez was a student of Furstenberg, not in the 60s, later, but, uh, so Furstenberg gave this problem to, to Yuval when he was doing his PhD, and Mike Kochman was a master student of Furstenberg, and Furstenberg also gave this problem to him. So I guess, yes? So you're saying that generic case should be the rest? Yeah, this is generic. The dissonant case is the exceptional one. Yeah, so for example, given any two sets A and B, for almost all real numbers R, A, and the scaling of B by R. Sorry, every, uh, yeah, so the definition is wrong. <laughs> but uh, if, the, if something is wrong, don't ask a question. Just tell me it's wrong. Of course it's wrong. <laughs> OK. So this was not the white line. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but the way, yeah, so I try to make the talk understandable, so if you don't, to everyone, so if you don't understand, please stop me. So it's not a problem to not cover everything I want you to say, this always happens actually, so, so I want you to understand whatever I, I am able to say. So if you don't understand something, for example, because it's strong, just ask or let me know. Okay, okay, so the conjecture is that uh, if A and B are times two and times three invariant, then they dissonate. And again, this is in accordance with the general principle because if they resonate, they have a lot of common structure and it shouldn't happen by according to this principle. So it is one possible way, among many others, to make this principle uh, concrete. Okay, so this was the conjecture and uh, I proved it together with Mike Kochman. Well, together with Yuval Perez, we proved a special case important special case, and then uh, together with Mike Kochman, we proved the general case. So we knew how to prove it in 2008, the preprint came out in 2009, and it was published in 2012. Let's try 2012 here. Okay, but here you see that I only drew the arrow going backwards. So I said, if they are resonant, then, well, I said it wrong, but now I'm saying it right. If they are resonant, then they have a lot of common structure. But this is definitely not an if and only if. It's as far as possible, so it's really very far from if and only if. So for example, most sets dissonate with themselves. So in general, the dimension of A plus A is twice the dimension of A, or one. So the one is here because these are a subset of R. So the dimension of the subset cannot be more than one. So if the sum of the dimensions is more than one, you, can, you cannot expect to have the sum of the dimensions because uh, it's bounded by one. Okay, so for, even for a typical set A, even for invariant sets, so even for times two invariant sets and three invariant sets, it can very well happen that the dimension of A plus A is, is so it, it, it is this, tries the dimension of A or one. So, this is definitely not a characterization of not having common structure because it's not even able to distinguish a set and itself. So it is a necessary or yeah, condition for not having common structure, but it's very far from sufficient. So this cannot be the end of the story. So let me give another definition. So I'm not going to say anything else about this. Maybe I'm going to mention one word that comes up in the proof. I'm going to say it now, CP process. Okay, I said it, now I'm going to move on. Maybe I will say a little bit more about CP process later. So another definition, so again we have two counter sets, and now I'm going to say that they are transversal if, no, I'm going to look at the intersections. Instead of looking at the sum set, I'm going to look at the intersections. So I'm going to say they are transversal if the dimension of the intersection is at most Um, the maximum between zero, it cannot be negative, and the sum of the dimensions minus one. Okay, again, this is the generic behavior. Two, sort of random, typical, whatever you want to say, it, uh, counter sets are transversal. So where does this number come from? Where does the number come from? Well, it is what you expect from counting arguments or it is what happened for subspaces. So this is saying that the co-dimensions add. The co-dimensions add. This is what happens for planes, so for, from linear algebra. Uh, and it's also what, what you expect if you try to, you imagine that uh, the dimension comes from covers by balls of the same size, for example, and uh, you look at some random, well, anyway. So there are many ways to uh, understand why this is the natural number. And I'm writing an upper bound here on not equality because in general these will be bounded sets or even if they are not bounded, they are, they are counter sets, so they have gaps, they have holes. So one of them could be contained in the gap of the other, for example, and then the intersection will be empty. So this can very well happen. So it's not true that generically you have equality here. Or at least you have to define generically in a more careful way if you want to have equality generically. If, you do, if you're not careful, you cannot hope to have equality in general, but you do have this inequality uh, 
generically. In particular, here comes another white lie. For example, <clears throat> One example of why this happens generically. So there is something called Marx trans intersection theorem. And it says that for any A and B, A and a typical image of B are transversal. So for almost all pairs of scaling and translation, these counter sets are transversal. Okay, so here comes another conjecture of Furstenberg. This one does appear in a paper from 1969, or I guess the paper appeared in 19, 1970. So it's a conference proceedings. The conference happened in 1969. The paper appeared in 1970. OK, so the conjecture is uh, that if A is times 2 invariant and B is times 3 invariant, so there is a weak version and a strong version. So the weak version says that A and B are transversal. And the stronger version says that A and any affine image of B are still transversal. For all RT. Because for almost all, it's true because it's true for any sets without any invariance requirements. So the point here is that he's asking this for all RT. And in particular, the most important that RT is R equals 1 and T equals 0. Of course, uh, R should not be 0. Well, it could be 0, because then it's trivial. Okay, it could be 0. Yes? Uh, when you say here it happens generically, there is some general meaning for generically, or just like? Well, it's a principle. So again, if this doesn't happen, that means that A and B should look very much alike at many scales, at many small, small scales. This is the way you should think about it. But can you say something like in the Hausdorff topology of complexity sets of the... Hausdorff topology has, is very bad for Hausdorff dimension. It's not the right topology to consider. Um, well, yeah. Well, I'm sure you can say something, but maybe generic from that point of view, generically from that point of view, this doesn't happen. So things are, are, are weird if you look at dimension. So, so, so yeah, so this is a branch. I mean, there are many people doing what happens for Hausdorff dimension for generic in that sense, and things are weird, it's not. So it's, it's maybe more measure theoretically, so something like this. Or if you take random sets, if A and B are generated in some random way, then you definitely have inequality, and actually you have equality, unless one is contained in a gap of the other, or something like this. OK, so. Uh, Heuristically, this conjecture, at least a strong version, the strong version, is stronger than this conjecture. And let me draw a picture to explain why. So let's look at the product set A times B. So here we have A, for example, A could be the middle of the first counter set. So from now on, I'm going to just look at one example, just for concreteness. So A will be the middle thirds counter set, and B will be the middle one quarter counter set. So it's the same contraction, but I have two intervals of length one quarter, and then I iterate. So this is going to be B. 
So A is times 3 invariant, B is time, times 4 invariant, and you can co easily cook up a times 2 invariant set out of B as well if you want. OK, and let's look at the product set. Then uh, what is the arithmetic sum? The arithmetic sum is just looking at the product. So the product is uh, first generation of the product is something like this. There are four rectangles. So the sum set is just the projection of the product in this direction. So if the sum set is large, then heuristically what should happen is that most fibers of this map, so in this case the sum of the dimensions is more than one. So the dimension of the middle first counter set is log two over log three, which is more than one half, and the dimension of B is one half. So the, dimension is, the sum of the dimensions is more than one in this case. So according to the previous theorem, the projection, the, the sum set which is a projection in this direction, has cause of dimension one. By the way, it's an open problem whether the sum set of this A and this B has positive Lebesgue measure. If you want to torture yourself for a little while, then think about this problem. OK. So the dimension, the projection has, yes? Can you repeat the problem? Yes. A is the middle third counter set. B is the middle one quarter counter set. Is it true that A plus B has positive Lebesgue measure? And if you're, you're, if you're very ambitious, you can think whether the sum set has non-empty interior. OK, but we know that it has dimension 1. And heuristically, this means that if you look at the fibers of the map, and the fibers of the map are intersection of, intersection of A and translates of B. So these are the fibers. So let me pick another color for the fibers. So the fibers of this map should be generically not too large. They should be small. Right? If, if all the fibers are very large, that means that there will be a drop. It has to be compensated in the projection in some way. So Hazard dimension doesn't work this way, at least not so easily. So everything I'm saying is not true. But morally, it is true that if the projection is large, many fibers, most fibers, should be small, and vice versa. The second conjecture is saying that all fibers are small. Not most, not almost all, but all fibers are small. So in this sense, heuristically, the second conjecture is stronger. And actually, it's not too hard to prove that it is really stronger. So this conjecture implies the first conjecture. Sorry? Was there a question? OK, so the second, the second conjecture is stronger. So this implies the previous conjecture. And another way of thinking about this is that this is a better way of characterizing common structure. For example, A and A, in general, could be dissonant. So this is not enough to distinguish A from A. But A and A are never transversal if the dimension of A is positive. So in dimension 0, this A is absolutely nothing. If the dimension of A or B is 0, then there is automatic transversality. This, this is nothing in the case of dimension 0. But if the dimension of A is not 0, then certainly A is not transversal to itself. So with this notion of um, common structure, transversality, well, this is a much finer way of finding common structure between A and B than looking at the sum set. So this was the motivation for the conjecture. Actually, Furstenberg, uh, in the paper, talks about transversality of semigroups. So this is the way where semigroups appear in this talk. So you can look at the semigroup generated by times 2 and the semigroup generated by times 3. And Furstenberg defines the transversality between semigroups exactly in this way saying that invariant sets for one semigroup and invariant sets for the other semigroup are transversal. Then the semigroups are transversal. OK, well, the conjecture is true. This was, this was a quite, uh, I, I would say, a daring conjecture. So it was not clear why this should happen, actually. So it's a very strong statement. I would say it's really much more surprising that it's true than the one about some sets. The one about some sets is easy to believe. So I think people believed that the, conject the sunset conjecture was true before anything was proved. But uh, they were not so sure about the intersection one. But the intersection one is also true. OK, and uh, so I proved it uh, about two years ago. And also uh, Mengu from the University of Oulu uh, also proved it. So I'm going to say a couple of words about the proofs. So the intersection conjecture.
Hawks. Okay, so the proofs are unbelievably different. So it's, it's amazing how different they are. And uh, so in fact, uh, so Meng at the time was at the University of Oulu in Finland. Now he's again at the University of Oulu in Finland. In between he was in Jerusalem. And I have a colleague, Ville Somal, at the University of Oulu. So I was visiting Ville when I was working on this. But I didn't mention that. So I thought I could prove the conjecture at that time, but it wasn't written down, so I didn't mention anything. But he told me that Meng Bu thinks that he can prove first numbers conjecture. Then I had to say, me too. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then Meng, Meng explained the proof to me, and it was unbelievably different. That's why there are two papers. I mean, if, if we had had the same idea, then there would have been one paper. But it, wasn't, it didn't make any sense to write one paper because the proofs are totally different. So you see that this is a very concrete, sort of one-dimensional problem. So it's an easy problem, right? I mean, it's a, everything is linear. So the easiest counter says you could possibly imagine. So it, it, it's very concrete, very OK. But Meng's proof uses very abstract ergodic theory. So he uses dynamics on a space of measures. And actually, it's amazing, because he uses the idea that Furstenberg, so in the original paper where he posed the conjecture, Furstenberg proved some partial results. In particular, although it's not written in the paper, Furstenberg proved that the conjecture holds if the sum of the dimensions of A and B is at most 1 half. And he did this by introducing dynamical system, which is called the CB process, which is a dynamical system where the phase space is a space of measures, actually even, even bigger. But a very large phase space. And the dynamics is basically zooming in. So you live in the space of measures, and the action of the dynamics is zooming, magnify into some part of the measure and zooming. So that's the dynamics of the CP process. So it's a very powerful tool, and actually is what we use with Mike Kochman to prove the sunset conjecture. So it's a tool that is all Furstenberg himself developed it, and we used it together with Mike Kochman. And it's actually what uh, Meng Vu used to prove his intersection conjecture. So he, he has to construct some steeper processes, and he does this in the same way. So in the same way that you prove that if you have a compact set and an invariant map, there is an invariant measure, you can construct the CP process. The problem when you do this is that you're just averaging. So you have no idea of what are the properties of the measure that you obtained. So it was known to my Kochman and me, and probably even to Furstenberg, that if this dynamical system that you obtain abstractly by averaging if you were very lucky and this dynamical system was weak mixing, then everything would be fine. Then the method of Furstenberg could be used to show that the, con the conjecture holds. But it doesn't have to be weak mixing, because this is a completely abstract measure, which is constructed by averaging. So sort of the new completely brilliant idea of Meng Bu was, uh, so I'm talking about his proof more than mine, but anyway. <laughs> so, so the brilliant idea was uh, to use Sinai's factor theorem. So this dynamical system that he constructs is easy to see that it has positive entropy. So there is a factor, Bernoulli factor, of the same entropy. It's a nice factor theorem, classical theorem. But it's all very, very abstract. So there is this very large phase space. There is this construction of an invariant measure in this very large phase space with some properties which is done by averaging and averaging again. And then there is this measure theoretical statement about very general, extremely general theorem about uh, having, well, Sinai's factor theorem, you have a Bernoulli factor. And by some magic, he's able to sort of pull, pull back information. So you have a Bernoulli factor of the same entropy. And so the, the very brilliant insight that Meng had was to realize that having, a, so because the factor has the same entropy, the fibers have zero entropy. And even though this factor is only, it's a measure theoretical factor, it doesn't have to be continuous at all, it's still enough to sort of pull back geometric information. And, and somehow, with a little, little bit more work, so still use the idea that would work if the original system was Bernoulli. Somehow, that's his idea. OK. So what I did was totally different, totally different. So my proof is much more concrete and one-dimensional as the problem. So I don't have to go to this uh, very general, much more abstract setting. OK. So. Um, OK, as usual, I don't have time. But let me say just, uh, well, I will start talking about the proof. And when my time is up, please let me know and I'll finish. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> OK. 
Maybe I will make a poll. So I, I will write down some ingredients in the proof and I, I will ask you uh, which one do you want me to tell something about. Okay, so there is a li little bit of ergodic theory, not that much, but there is a little bit of ergodic theory that uh, appears in the form of some properties of cocycles. So, th so there is a cocycle, so ergodic theory. of cocycles over uniquely ergodic transformations. <laughs> then there is a multifractional analysis. In particular, there is something called LQ spectrum or LQ dimension of a measure, which is a very, very classical object in multifractal analysis that is very important in the proof. And then there is lots of additive combinatorics. And then, um, so before my paper, there was a very significant paper of Mike Hochman on some similar measures. So the theme is a bit different. On the surface, it's maybe totally different, but under the surface, it's uh, quite closely related. Um, and somehow, the, the overall structure of the proof very much follows uh, Hochman's approach for studying some similar measures. But all the details in all the steps are totally different. But somehow the very general structure is uh, following Michael Hohmann's ideas. OK, so maybe there is not going to be a vote. I'm just going to start talking about the proof. And then well, when my time is up, I will stop. OK. so. Uh, so I like projections. I like orthogonal projections a lot. So if I can reinterpret the problem in terms of projections, maybe I can do something. And if I can't, then I can't. So in this case, even though the problem is about, so the sum set, you see, the sum set was about projections, was exactly about projections. The sum set is a projection for me. It's not the sum set, it's a projection. Then I was able to do something. OK, so this is an intersection problem. So it doesn't, see, it doesn't seem to be about projections so much. So the first step for me, and this is already totally different from, from what Meng did, was to uh, convert this into a parallel projection. So let me tell you how to do it. So on A, you have a measure, extremely natural measure, the measure mu. It's just the Cantor Lebesgue measure on the middle third Cantor set. Let's call it mu1, maybe, mu1. It's a measure of maximal entropy, Hausdorff measure. So it's a nat natural measure. You put weight one half, one half, and then you keep going in the next intervals. And the same here, on the set B, the middle one quarter set. So this is just an example, but it's basically as difficult as the general theorem. So we only need to understand this example. So on B, you have another measure. Let's call it mu2. Again, it's a measure of maximal entropy, the Hausdorff measure, the most natural measure you could put on the set uh, B. And then you have the product measure, mu. It's a product measure to be here upstairs. And then we can project the measure. So OK, something that happens uh, already for the sunset problem and also happens here is that even if you're interested about one projection in particular, you have to study all the projections at once. And this is actually an insight that comes from Google Morera's work, well, partly with your course on the Paris conjecture and also Google's work on sums of counter sets. Uh, so I have to say that somehow everything started with Google in some, in some sense. So my first result with Yuval Perez, so the main idea was uh, so Google has a, pay, has a result, which he never wrote, uh, wrote down, as usual. But uh, he explained to me many, many years ago about sums of nonlinear counter sets. And for, for him, nonlinearity was very essential. And what Yuval and I realized was basically that you can replace nonlinearity by something else. So everything started with Google in some, some sense. OK, anyway, 
And, but the, the idea that you have to look at all the projections at once, even if you only care about one projection comes from Google. OK. So we have the product measure upstairs mu. And maybe let's call mu theta. It's just a projection of mu under projection with angle theta. So this is angle theta, and here we have mu theta. So it's just the push down of the measure. Push down of the measure means that the measure of an interval downstairs is the measure of this strip upstairs. So this is mu theta. OK, and then th let me define the following number for any measure. So d infinity of a measure nu is the largest possible Frostman exponent of the measure. So it's the supremum. So it's a very natural number. It's the supremum of, of all s such that the measure of a ball of radius r is controlled by r to the s, and a constant that could depend on s. For example, Lebesgue measure on r has the infinity dimension 1, trivially. In this case, you actually have equality, not just upper inequality. But this is a very natural condition, Frostman condition, that appears everywhere that you're working with fractal measures. OK. so. Uh, why I'm calling it the infinity is going to become apparent in a minute. So here is a claim, which is easy to prove. Maybe I will even prove it. It is enough to show, so to prove the conjecture, so uh, it is enough to show that the d infinity dimension of all these projected measures is 1. Well, in this case, 1, because in this case, the projection has dimension 1. So we're in the regime where the sum of the dimensions is more than 1. If the sum of the dimensions was less than 1, then here, instead of 1, we would have the sum of the dimensions. So one, so here, what really goes here is the minimum between the sum of the dimensions of, and, and one. In this example, it is one. OK, so this is very easy. So maybe I will explain it. So let me start over with the picture. So it's going to be the same picture, but the scattered. So what I did, did here was exactly what I wanted to do, which, which is to have a version of the conjecture involving projections and dimensions. So this is what I like, projections and dimensions. OK, so here we have this product measure. Here we have one of these projections. Here is A, here is B. And what do we want to do? We want to show that the intersection of A and B are more generally. So the, when I say that the conjecture is true, the strong version of the conjecture is true, the strong version. You cannot prove the weak version without the strong version. So to prove that A and B are transversal, you have to prove that A and any affine image of me are transversal. You cannot do one without the other. OK, so the intersection of A and an affine image of B is exactly the same as looking at a linear fiber of the product of A and B. So here I mean, so the intersection of the product set with this line is exactly the intersection of A and an affine image of, of B, by definition. OK, so I'm assuming that I was able to prove this. And OK, I want to estimate the Hausdorff dimension of the intersection of A times B and this line from above. So I just need to show that I have good covers. That's enough. So then I cover this intersection by balls of some radius r in some optimal way. So this is a, well, an efficient covering of the intersection by balls of radius r. And then all I have to note is that if I project, so, so if, if I take a strip that con contains, so has more or less the same size as the radius of these balls. So these are balls of all of the same radius r. Well, then the measure downstairs of this segment is going to be how many balls I have times the mass of each ball. But the measure upstairs is extremely nice. The measures mu1 and mu2, these are, these are alpha's regular measures. So mu1 of a, of a segment here is r to log 2 over log 3, up to a constant, if the segment is centered in the set a. a. And the same for b with exponent 1 half instead of log 2 over log 3. So the measures mu1 and mu2 are extremely regular, extremely uniform, extremely nice, and so is the product measure. So we know what is the measure of each of these balls. We know. And they are all equal. 
They are equal to r to the 1 half plus log 2 over log 3, each of these. But then we know what is, so we have an upper bound, which is what we need. We have an upper bound for the measure of this, this segment. And then we have an upper bound for how many balls we have. And believe me that the upper bound is exactly what you want to have to have the conjecture. So that's all. So it's trivial. So there is nothing here. It's really trivial. Okay. So this is the reduction to a problem about projections. And maybe let me try uh, to say something about this cosico and what reduction this er ergodic theoretic argument achieves. So we want to prove this. And in fact, it's enough to prove this not for all theta, but for an interval of theta. Once you have it for a non-trivial interval of theta, you can use a self-similarity here and a self-similarity here to move this interval around and cover the whole line. So it's enough to prove this for <coughs> theta in some interval. OK, unfortunately, the d-infinity dimension is too difficult to handle. So instead of working with the d-infinity dimensions, I work with the dq, with the DQ dimensions. So let me define this. So this is the LQ spectrum that I mentioned here. So let me define this. So this is a limit. In general, a limit, but in this case, the limit actually exists. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of s n q of nu. OK, no, I need some logarithms, I guess, and a minus sign. OK, limit of minus is n q of, oh, I missed the log again. Log of s n q of nu divided by n. And I have to tell you who is s n q of nu. This is the sum over dyadic intervals of length 2 to the minus n. Nu of i to the q. Ah, and here I have a q minus 1 in the denominator. And now it's correct. OK, so I look at these moment sums, which are quite natural. And then I look at the power law behavior of these moment sums. And this q minus 1 in the denominator is just a normalization factor that ensures that this is in 0, 1 if nu is a measure on r. If nu is a measure on rd, it's between 0 and d. So this is a notion of dimension. So if the measure is more or less spread out, it's going to be large. If the measure is very concentrated, it's going to be small. So this is a reasonable notion of dimension of a measure. It's not one dimension. It's a family of dimensions. It's parameterized by q. And it's very, very well known in multifractal. So it's one of the most basic objects of study in multifractal analysis. OK, and here is an exercise for you. dq of nu tends to the infinity of nu when q tends to infinity. So it is enough to show, so a further reduction, it is enough to show that the q of nu is, no, the q of mu theta, the q of these projections, is 1 for every q for every theta. And this is what I really proved. So why do I work with this? So uh, at first sight, this can look much more complicated than this. But this is much better, because there is some convexity. So this is closely related to LQ norms. So this is an LQ norm in some sense. So it, 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 it is an LQ norm. So there is convexity. For Q equal infinity, there is no convexity. For Q finite, there is convexity. So this has much better properties, even though if you've never seen it before, it looks ugly. It's wonderful. It's not ugly. OK, I think I have just enough time to uh, say where the ergodic theory comes in. OK, so it turns out that uh, in a previous paper with Yuval Perez and uh, Fedya Nazarov, we realized that these moment sums are actually a cycle if we look at the, so not at the general measure, but at the projections that we have to look at. So we have these projections, these projections here, mu theta. And let's consider the following sequence of functions of theta, fn of theta. So q is fixed. q is some fixed large number. So it tends to infinity at the very end. So q is some fixed large number. And this is just the moment sum at level n. So here is the n. The q is fixed. 
And then I want to look at mu theta, but I'm not going to use theta, maybe let's call it t. I have to reparametrize. So here theta is an angle. I don't want to have an angle. Maybe I want to have something to e to the tangent of, okay, uh, what do I want to do? Uh, t, something like this. Well, I, I don't know if this is correct, but I have to reparametrize. So an angles are not good to, to get eco-cycle, but it's just a smooth reparametrization. It doesn't change anything. So you can imagine that we have theta here. It doesn't really matter. Okay, and then the proposition that it was actually, for this particular case, uh, proved in the paper with Nazarov, and Yuval Perez and myself, is that, uh, maybe let's put the log here to get something subadditive instead of submultiplicative, then f n plus k of t is less or equal than f n of t plus f k uh, r to the n of t. And what is r? r is translation by angle log 2 over log 3 in the circle. So at some point, you have to use that log, three, log 2 over log 3 is irrational, right? Because otherwise, it would be false. For example, if we have 2 and 2, if we have the same set here and here, it's completely false. So it is important that log 2 over log 3 is irrational, and it is used exactly here. r is an irrational rotation. Maybe it's not log 2 over log 3, maybe it's log 3 over log 2, log 2, but something like this. So it's an irrational rotation related to 2 and 3. This is definitely true. I started a couple of minutes late, so I'm going to take two more minutes, sorry. And then I promise I'll stop. So I, I want to mention the ergodic theory part, and I'm, I'm really almost there. Okay, so this is a uniquely ergodic transformation. It's an irrational rotation, it's uniquely ergodic. So this is what really matters, it's uniquely ergodic. So, one of the most basic results in ergodic theory, which is in every textbook, is that if you have a uniquely ergodic transformation, then ergodic average is converged uniformly for continuous functions. If you have never seen this, it's a very good exercise so do, that you can do. In fact, the, even if function is not continuous, if it's continuous almost everywhere, it's enough. Ergodic average is converged everywhere uniformly if the system is uniquely ergodic. Well, here I have a subadditive co-cycle. So we have the subadditive ergodic theorem. So we know that, so we know that Fn over n converges almost everywhere by the subadditive ergodic theorem, but the transformation is uni uniquely ergodic. So what is the analog of this elementary result in ergodic theory that ergodic averages converge uniformly when you don't have an ergodic average, but you have a subadditive co-cycle? Well, there is a one-sided version that, that, that is the same. It is not true that the, it's not true that Fn over n converges uniformly if the cycle is uniquely ergodic. Let's say it converges to some limit L, L for limit. But what is true is that the limb soup of Fn over n is at most L everywhere. And uniformly. The uniformly part is not so important for me, but so the limb soup of Fn over n is at most the typical value everywhere, everywhere. This is the part that uses unique ergodicity. So in this way, this was stated by, and proved by Furman, but actually there is a proof of the subadditive ergodic theorem by Katznelson Katz and Weiss, and if you look at their proof, this is there. It, it is, you just have to read the proof. It is there. Okay, and this performs the magic, so, Fn, it is this. So if you look at Fn over n, what you get in the limit is the LQ dimension. And what this, what this allows is we need to prove that dQ of mu theta is one for every theta, for every theta. Using this, it is enough to prove it for almost every theta. Because if it's true for almost every theta, then it's true for every theta. Because the worst case is the typical case. You could be worried that the inequalities are going in the wrong way around, but there is a minus here, so, so it is fine. So, so this is very important, because there is a part of the proof that only works for almost every theta. It, it's not true, or it's impossible to prove for every theta. But in this way, it is enough to prove that the typical behavior is a good behavior. 
Okay, I think this is enough. Thank you very much. Sorry? Again, how do you get the DQB from the... Where you are calculating the DQB is needed. Okay, yes, so, so this, this I, I guess I had called it mu theta. Yeah, what is the question? Yes, yeah, okay, again, so how do you use the digital body so that the subad and the body to improve the, the last step? <laughs> Can't you repeat what you have said the last two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> sure, okay. Okay, so we need to prove that this converges to one okay. when nu is the projections, is any projection of the product measure. Okay. There. Okay, so if you, just, if you just look at the numerator without the minus sign, uh -huh. and here, instead of nu, you look at mu theta, well, you, you, you can think of this as a, sequence of functions of theta. Okay, this sequence of functions of theta are actually a cocycle if you reparameterize theta in the correct way. Because it is a cocycle, you can apply the subadditive ergodic theorem that tells you that this converges to some number L almost everywhere. This tells you that there is some number L which you have no idea what it is to begin with, such that this, so it tells you that so it tells you that this is L for almost every theta. Okay? This is what you know from just the subadity ergodic theorem. So it's very far from what we need because we need to know that this L is one and we need to remove the almost everywhere. What this does, the fact that the system is uniquely ergodic, so, so you have a one-sided inequality which holds everywhere, it allows you to remove the almost every if you can prove that L is one. But you still have to prove that L is 1. I haven't said anything about how to prove that L is 1. So this takes 25 pages. Okay, okay. But what do you say? What is the technique for L equal 1? To show that L equal 1? Well, uh, added to combinatorics. So basically, this measure mu 1 is a it has a convolution structure. Because uh, y y you can realize it as the distribution of a random sum where you pick left interval or right interval at, at every step. And the same for mu 2. So the same for mu theta, because you are projecting under, so it's a sum, distribution of the sum is a convolution. So mu theta is a convolution. And then there are results in additive combinatorics that tell you that convolutions get smoother unless something happens. And then we have to show that this, sum, this bad something doesn't happen using self-similarity. Yeah, so there is something called, actually, my notes for the talk, see, these are my notes for the talk. So I haven't actually gotten to, to this. <laughs> so I, I wanted to, if I had time, I never have time, to mention one very important theorem called the Valux and Meredith Gowers theorem, which is a key result in additive combinatorics and has many applications in particular, in many areas, in particular in ge geometric group theory and ergodic theory, and, and, also, and also here. So it's, it's really somehow the, the magic behind the proof is the Valux and Meredith Gowers theorem. So in some sense, it's all an elaborate application of the Balux and Meredith Gower's theorem.